What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. I met a guy from Ecuador, a student. They were telling me about this situation down there where they described it as like one of the worst pollutions in the world. Not an accident done deliberately by Texaco, American oil company, in this pristine ecosystem where indigenous peoples had been living for, you know, thousands of years, living off the forest. And the upshot is what we saw was really an apocalyptic disaster. It's the only way I can describe it. I mean, I expected to see pollution, but this was so much worse than anything I ever could have imagined. Steve, thanks so much for coming, man. I've really been looking forward to this podcast. Your story is absolutely insane, and we're going to go through all of it today. Great. Thank you for having me. Of course. Of course. So I actually, this is probably the longest podcast in the making we've ever had, because you're a very busy guy, because of all the things you're involved with, not just with your own case, but with other causes that I'm sure you'll talk about today. But I had first been turned on to what happened with you right after I initially had in my friend Paul Rosalie for a podcast. I was telling you about him. On the outskirts of Manu National Park, this guy, local guy, started going into the jungle and like leaving them piles of bananas. Cause they're, they're hunter gatherers. They don't have, they don't have metal. They missed out on the wheel. They've never held a spoon. These are people that are out there. And so he'd leave them a machete and some bananas and they'd come take it. And then after like a year, he would start being there when they came to take it. And then after some time, he was actually able to interact with them. And he couldn't, he could only speak a few words of their language. This what went do on, they speak? They're called the Mashkupiro tribe. And so they speak some sort of, uh, some dialect of the Yin a language but this guy who was interacting with them one day they found him they call it porcupine arrows sticking up out of his body like several arrows we don't know why they killed him before this one but he's lived in the amazon for the last 18 years it's a very popular episode people loved his stories and a couple fans hit me up and said hey you got to have on this guy steve donziger he's in the middle of this 30-year odyssey fighting for the people of Ecuador over what Chevron did to them. And so then I went in and researched the case, and I've talked about it on other podcasts since then, so some listeners are going to be familiar with at least the outlines. But you essentially got into something at the end of law school that you didn't think was going to be anything. And it turns into this, I mean, I don't think I'm overstating it to say like a war, basically. And you're going to get to how this has ended up for you and, and all that. But to me, it's, it's, it's a story that's a prime example of greed and when capitalism goes wrong and other people around the world, to put it very simply, get f Yeah. I mean, I, when I started working on this back in the early 90s, I had just gotten out of law school. My last year of law school, uh, I met a guy from Ecuador, a student, um, whose father was – also from, an, from Ecuador, living in Massachusetts. And they were telling me about this situation down there where they described it as like one of the worst pollutions in the world. Um, not an accident done deliberately by Texaco, American oil company, in this pristine ecosystem where indigenous peoples had been living for you know thousands of years, living off the forest. And um, they're like, we got to do something about this. At least, go, at least go down there and see what happened see if we can build some sort of legal case out of it. I mean, what lawyers do generally is they're trained to <laughs> find lawsuits or practice law defending lawsuits. Um, and it interested me because I'm a public interest guy, I'm an environmentalist, and I like to help people. That's why I went to law school. So we organized a, a, a mission of roughly 15 people on that first trip, got funding. Mm -hmm. And it was a combination of law students, lawyers, and doctors, and public health people. And the goal of the mission was to investigate what had actually happened. And the lawyers were talking to witnesses and taking testimonies from, you know, indigenous peoples and others in the Amazon. 
And the doctors were sort of doing medical tests and doing water tests of like rivers and streams that people were drinking out of that were near these oil wells and, and all this oil pollution. The upshot is what we saw was really an apocalyptic disaster. It's the only way I can describe it. I mean, I expected to see pollution, but this was so much worse than anything I ever could have imagined. It really made me question my whole concept of humanity, of the human condition. Like I could not imagine human beings would design this kind of system. What kinds of things did you see? Well, the, the first thing you notice, and this is a, a large area of the Amazon, it's about 1,500 square miles in size. And that was the area of the um, concession. That is, that's the area that Texaco paid Ecuador's government to drill in, to look for oil in back in the 1960s. And they discovered oil in this area and then built a, a bunch of well sites and produced oil out of this area for roughly 25 years until the early 1990s. And by the time they left in 1992, they had gouged about a thousand waste pits out of the jungle floor that were unlined. Waste pits? We oil waste pits. And what they had done is when they drilled a well in the jungle, they would clear like the far. I mean, the forest is very thick. They yes. would clear out the forest around the well site. And they would, you know, bring in heavy equipment and, and you know, sort of drill into the earth thousands of feet. Thousands of feet. Thousands of feet. And the process of drilling into the earth is a very violent process, which has cultural and other implications for the indigenous people, which I'll get to in a second. Okay. But bottom line is what, what comes out of these holes that go thousands of feet down is what's called drilling muds. That's an industry term. And drilling muds consist of rock and all sorts of chemicals, usually carcinogenic chemicals that, that the oil company puts in the hole to lubricate it to make the drilling process easier. And also there's natural heavy metals in the earth that come out. Mm. And this is all waste. It's very harmful to human health and to the environment and to animal health. And the question is, where do you put it? You know, and normally you dispose of it properly, but Texaco, because they treated the Amazon thinking, you know, they would never be held accountable. They treated it like it was basically a garbage dump. And Texaco was later bought by Chevron exactly. just for people following at home. Exactly. Yeah. Texaco, now Chevron. Right. Um, they, they would kind of dig these pits out of the jungle and just dump the drilling muds into, the, into these pits. And so when, when, you, when I got there that first trip, I saw like what looked like, like lakes of oil waste. It looks like oil or thick oil or kind of crusted oil in these open air pits. And when I when you get near them, they stink. The vapors are, it's hot there. The sun's out. Vapors are coming up off the ground. And the worst part is the pits were unlined, so it was all leaking into the soil and groundwater. And they also, for many of the pits, built pipes that they stuck into the sides of them to run the, the contents of the pits, that is the cancer-producing oil waste, out of the pits into nearby streams and rivers. So it goes everywhere. That the people were drinking out of. They basically took these pits and rather than disposing of the waste properly, and also in the Amazon it rains a lot. So they need, you know, the pits would overflow and they put the pipes in to sort of drain them out. Um, they essentially created a system that ended up poisoning the water supply of thousands of thousands of people who were drinking out of these rivers and streams. Not just the water supply, but the food supply because people would fish out of these rivers to, for their sustenance. And they would also bathe in the rivers. I mean, it was their, it was their, their environment was their food and their medicine, their livelihood, you know, provided their shelter, you know, to build houses and stuff. So what, what was really the most, the worst thing about this was to really see it with my own eyes and see how extensive it was. I mean, there were literally hundreds of these pits with pipes polluting streams and rivers all over this region. Thank you for watching the video, guys. Please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.